that that will be debt free, but that us as a church will be debt free. Um, imagine a church that is debt free. Imagine a church, and by that I mean people. Imagine, imagine us as a group of people able to do anything God asks us to do because you're not hindered and held back by debt. End of the day, debt is slavery, is it not? Um, the, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the verse somewhere in Proverbs, but it says um, it, 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 the, the one to who you owe, um, you're slaves to that one. And so at any point that we are in debt, we are slaves to, we are in slavery to whatever degree we are in debt, right? And that's not a condemnation thing for anybody in this room. It is a, it needs to be a, 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 a there needs to be this thing that God's stirring up in the inside of us of God, you're going to do something in my life. You're going to show me how to steward my finances well so we, I can move out of debt into a place of absolute freedom. And I really believe that that's, that's the heart of God for us. Uh, you know, um, centuries ago, debt wasn't, it wasn't really as big a deal as it is today. You know, today you can just go and borrow beyond your means, beyond your means, beyond, beyond your means, you know. And uh, people run into massive amounts of trouble in, in that way. And imagine a church that is debt-free. People. That is debt-free. That we're, 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 let's say like this, the 80% are debt-free and the 20% are those who've kind of only been part of this environment for, for a shorter amount of time. But those who are in this environment, as we're growing, as we're learning, and as we're pushing into God together, God, God is doing incredible things in our lives and helping us to make wise decisions. Um, and uh, through that, we're able to advance the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ across the nations of the earth. Amen? So that's a dream. You can dream with me, and let's trust God together. I want to speak today about thankfulness. Thankfulness. And no, this is not a Sunday school topic. This is, I would say, children actually don't really need necessarily as much teaching on this as adults do. Um, uh, you know, we're always telling our, your children to say thank you, right? Say thank you. Don't forget to say thank you. Say thank you. Well, uh, some of you are, right? Telling your children to say thank you? Yeah. Um, but what I'm finding is that it's harder for adults to say thank you. And it's, uh, it's, it's hard to go up to an adult and say, hey, don't forget to say thank you. You know, it's easier to tell your child that than to, you know. Um, I, I just, so I just wanted to focus in on this today. This is, this is, a, this is not going to be like this big... Um, wow, you know, put together message. That's not, that's not the point of today. Although <laughs> I was thinking yesterday, is Sonia here? Is she out somewhere? She, um, her favorite, one of her favorite preachers on the planet leads a church in Pretoria. And, um, and one of her other favorite preachers happens to be preaching in that church today. So she would have very happily had me fly up to Pretoria today. So I'm under tremendous pressure because she could be there, but she's here. So anyway, that was just a joke. It's just, please don't come up to me after and say, David, that was an amazing message. I don't need you to tell me that. <laughs> as long as, just say thank you. Just say, yeah, there we go. Thanks, Nora. Just say thank you. And um, hopefully God works in our lives. Amen. But I was just, this current season that we're facing in South Africa is a, is a relatively tough season. We've, if you think about, you know, coming into 2019, there were, I remember people saying things like, yo, 2018 was a really, really difficult year. And then there were people who were saying, in our environment, 2019 was really, really, really tough. Um, but a lot of those things were um, kind of maybe a little bit more personal focus, as in someone, someone's particular set of circumstances in their lives or a certain group of people. But then we hit 2020, and, it, and suddenly we had this pandemic that went, swept across the entire world. And whatever you think about it, it absolutely changed the way we live. It changed everything about how we do life, and it's amazing. Even now, when you when you when you talk or you listen or you read books, um, uh, you know um, you're finding on videos that you watch and books that you that you read that 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 COVID is mentioned in the books. It's because everybody knows what you're talking about, right? Um, movies that that are, that have come out have things have COVID in 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 different places. That's become part of our culture, part of our lives. You, you would have thought, you know, just over three years ago that that would have been the case, right? And of course, it affected so many things. And off the back of that, if you, if you happen to live in KZN, we had all of that. Then the next year, we had riots. And then the year after that, we had floods. That's like, poof, poof, poof. You know? If you're in the boxing ring, that's a lot of, that's some heavy hitting right there. And um, some of you are still trying to wipe the blood off your nose as you're getting up off the ground, you know? Not really, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, there's, there's this... There's this uh, I don't watch boxing, so. Um, <laughs> um, but there, there is a sense of so, so much has happened, and we're in this really um, 
strange, tough, difficult situation, environment, um, time that we live in, season. And as we, we're carrying on with life and things are happening and people are able to do things again. And, and uh, I'm so grateful that we don't have to wear masks anymore. Last year, one of my favorite moments last year was burning all our masks. It was fantastic. Um, we had so much fun burning. I didn't, the, the amount of um, poisonous gases that went up in the air as all that plastic burnt was insane. Um, but it was fun. Sorry, sorry for those of you who missed it. It really was fun. <laughs> all those germs. Oh, well, we killed those germs, that's for sure. Um, but what I'm going after is this, is that there's plenty to be negative about. And then all, I haven't even mentioned our political climate, just all the things that are going on, the, the corruption, all the stuff that's happening. I haven't even mentioned any of that. And when you, it, there's so much that we can stop. And this, as we think about these things, there's so much we can be critical about, that we can be negative about. That we can just feel like we've been hard done by, like, 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 um, woe is me. That kind of feeling of like, you know, can I not just catch a break? Anyone ever felt like, can I not just catch a break? You know, you know what that feels like sometimes, right? And uh, think about, uh, I, was, I had a, a conversation with a farmer this week. Uh, we, we, had, we had lunch together and we were just talking about the difficult situation the farmers are facing. The, the farmers in our environment and in our area, KZN and beyond, are facing incredibly, incredibly difficult challenges. Incredibly difficult challenges. And it blows my mind because they produce the food that we all eat. So it makes my brain, it makes no sense in my head that so many farmers are on the brink of going bankrupt. And I'm thinking, we need them to grow food. (laughs) Because I don't know about you, but I enjoy eating. It keeps me going. It keeps me alive. Right? Um, But farmers are are suffering, and obviously as a result of all that, food prices are just shooting through the roof. Petrol, diesel prices, the cost of living is, is gone up. And it's not just happening in South Africa. It's happening in so many different places. And in the middle of all that, I'm thinking, so... What is it that God is wanting to do in your life and in my life in this season while all this stuff is happening? And something I felt incredibly challenged by this week was this whole issue of being thankful. And I've just, I've just been thinking a little bit about my own mindset and my own attitude um, towards things. And I generally, I have a very positive attitude towards life and, and towards things that are happening. And I, I, I really do, um, I really do f- carry a lot of hope on the inside of me where I do believe things are going to get better. There's going to be incredible things coming into the future, that there is this confident expectation that there is good coming from God. But there are moments in the journey where you just stop and go, how long? How long is this going to take before there's going to be some kind of breakthrough, some kind of something's going to be different? I mean, how much more can we take as, as, a, as, as a province, KZN? How much more can we, can we manage? And, and uh, you know, you keep thinking like, well, we can't go any lower. From here, it can only be right. And then something else happens. And you're like, well, okay, we didn't realize there was a new low. And then, you, you know, <laughs> hopefully it's going to go up now. <laughs> I'm not trying to make us all depressed. What I am trying to do is really challenge us this morning. Really, I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to challenge us because there is a mindset that you and I have to carry in the midst of all of us. You know, I, I, I haven't got the scripture yet today, but Paul, Paul would, it, it, it's in Corinthians, I think, where he would, uh, he would talk about his light and momentary afflictions. And his light and momentary afflictions in his life looked like being stoned, being whipped 39 times, 39 times, you know, one short of 40, because apparently if you got whipped 40 times, you probably would die. So they'd take him to the brink of death, and that happened to him, I don't know, you can read it in Corinthians, two or three times. We know that he was stoned at one point, and then they, everyone left, left him there for dead, and then he got up and walked into the, I would love to see what that looked like. You know, they, they left him dead on the ground, and then he stood up and walked with the, with the brethren and went and had a meal or something. I don't know what. That's just crazy. Then we do know, obviously, that he was shipwrecked. You know, it was, I mean, it was an intense shipwrecking situation where, um, where, where he, um, the people on the boat, they hadn't eaten for days and days and days. And eventually God speaks to Paul through an angel. And Paul says, come, we, you need to eat some food because you're going to need some strength because the ship's going down. But none of you are going to die. And you think like, well, you know, God, you're a, you're a God of the miraculous. Like you could keep that ship together, surely. But that ship breaks up and they all get saved and on, the, on, the, on, the, on the island. And then, you know, you think, well, God could have saved the ship. He didn't save the ship. But then Paul is helping gather some wood and a snake bites his hand and, um, 
and, he, and it's a poison snake that should kill him, and he flicks it off, and he carries on. You're like, well, God did that miracle, but didn't, didn't keep the ship going. There's so many things you and I don't understand. And we can have all our theories as well, right? We can have our theories. Oh, God did it like that because of, like, because of. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of us, our, our thinking about some of these things is actually just a theory. So we don't, we don't know why some things happen the way they happen. We know why some things happen. We don't know why other things happen. Um, but Paul went through some really, really tough stuff. But he, he had learned the secret of contentment in the midst of that all. There was such a contentment about how he did life. And I just wonder when I listen to sometimes the thoughts that go through my own head and sometimes the things that come out my mouth. And then when I listen to others talk, I just wonder if, if, it's, if that's how Paul would have spoken if he was alive in our day. I'm just, just wanting us to think about this a little bit because we've just been singing about the reign of God, that if he is Lord in my life, it's got to look like something. I, I have to sound different to the world, not just, I don't use the swear words, you know, because they will say something negative, right? But they will throw in a bunch of other words that you and I would probably not use, right? But then we say the same thing minus the words that just sounds like an Mnet movie where it goes beep, beep, silent or whatever, whatever. How does the movie go? It goes silent in that moment, eh? So it's exactly the same thing. It's just there's these gaps of silence. So, so there's, it doesn't help if you and I look just like the world in our negativity and complaining. Am I making sense? That we have to sound different if we are followers of Jesus Christ. Paul sounded different. Those early disciples sounded different. They got kicked out of Jerusalem because Paul was persecuting them with his with his. But he says before he gave his life to the Lord. And so they all left Jerusalem and there's this massive persecution. So everywhere they go, they just tell people about Jesus and revival spreads. Then Paul comes to know the Lord and then more revival spreads. And eventually at the end of all of this, Paul finds himself about to die. And he gets, he gets killed basically as, you know, you're, he's a traitor. He's all sorts of things. And he, he gets his head chopped off. But he says, I've run the race. I've, I've finished the race. I've run the race. Uh, there is this prize waiting for me. What a focus. What a mindset. Imagine for you and for me, if our focus every single day is, I'm, there's a race that I am running. Rather than a concern about all these things that create so much negativity in our lives. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, and we've spoken of this a little bit this year, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. And we still sometimes find ourselves being worried about the, all these things and not focus on, I'm seeking first his kingdom. I'm following my Lord. I'm doing what he told me to do. And in the process, I'm going to have a mindset, a, a, a way of thinking that's going to be different to the world. It has to be different. It has to sound different. We have to sound different in how we speak. We can't just, uh, yeah, so let me carry on. I'm very happy, by the way. Um, I, thinking about what we are facing, then, then my mind jumps to things like the civil war that's been taking place in Syria for the last 12 years. 12 years of civil war. Homes bombed. People losing their livelihood, losing their arms, losing their children, losing their parents, losing family members displaced millions and millions and millions of refugees displaced in massive refugee camps as a result of 12 years of civil war i think about northern mozambique some of you know roland and heidi baker they live up in pemba in the in northern mozambique and the 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 rebels that have been coming in and just causing havoc up there people being killed people then going through villages and just killing people and that's happening a few thousand kilometers away from where we live right I think about the war in Sudan that um, was mentioned at the beginning because a whole bunch of Western people needed to get out the country, but now no one's reporting on it. But it's into its sixth week, and it's, 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 it's a, human, a humanitarian disaster, and they already had disasters. But just in these last six weeks, 1.1 million people have been displaced. The, our Ugu district's about 700,000 people. That helps us do the maths, right? And then, of course, there's the war that's been going on for ages now, um, for the last year or so, with Ukraine and Russia. And just the devastation and the things that people are facing. And I think about all that, and this is not to make me feel bad or any of us feel bad, right? I'm still happy. Anyone else happy in the room? Thank you, Marco. I think about all that, and I just think, like, it is still possible for people in those environments to be thankful. 
it's possible for you and me to carry a, an attitude of gratitude in our lives. Because the Bible doesn't change, even for the person displaced in northern Mozambique, Sudan, Ukraine, Syria, the Bible's still the same Bible. And it still says the same things. It still says rejoice always. For the one who follows Jesus, our attitude is completely different to the rest of the world. In the middle of absolute despair, poverty, war, death, and destruction, there can be this contentment and this place of my security is found in Jesus Christ and I can, I can give thanks in all circumstances. That's the kind of thankfulness that God has called you and I to. And it's a supernatural thankfulness. It's not just a, don't forget to say thank you when someone, you know, hands you something. Don't forget to say thank you, you know. It goes way beyond that, but it includes those moments. It includes the little, little day by day, moment by moment, mundane thank you moments. It includes saying thank you even when you don't need to. Because it becomes part of our lives that we are just, we become a thankful people. Regardless of your and my physical state, we can choose thankfulness health or whatever our health situation is, regardless of our financial state, we can choose thankfulness. Regardless of our emotional state, we can choose thankfulness. Regardless of our mental state, we can choose thankfulness. I think you're getting the picture, right? Regardless of the economy, we can choose thankfulness. Regardless of the politics, we can choose thankfulness. Regardless of our safety and security issues, we can choose thankfulness. So should I get a little bit deeper? You guys ready? Okay. We always have an opportunity to say thank you. And just to start off uh, to say this, thank, saying thank you acknowledges God in your life and in my life. Saying thank you acknowledges God in our lives. A lack of thankfulness is a lack of the acknowledgement of God in our lives. That's a big deal. So to... Just think a little bit more around thankfulness. Let's, let's look at what the opposite of thankfulness. So I, I threw thankfulness into Google and said, and said, give me the opposite of thankfulness. And there, there was a whole bunch of words that popped up. You want the list? It just helps you just kind of think about these things, I would say, kind of come out of thankfulness. And I'm going to go from this into a list of the fruit of, sorry, it comes out of unthankfulness. And I'm going to go into a list of the fruit of unthankfulness just to help us think this thing through for, in our own lives. This is not, this is, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are not under any condemnation. What we are under is the, the desire to become more like Jesus, to grow into maturity, to carry his, his heart and his attitude towards life. Because when we do that, we attract the reign of heaven. Amen. So here's, here's some, some thoughts on the opposite of thankfulness. Obviously, ingratitude. So opposite of thankfulness would be unthankfulness. But there's more than that. Unappreciation, ungratefulness, apathy, criticism. Disapproval, disbelief, disdain, dishonor, dislike, disregard, disrespect, hate, ignorance, indifference, insensitivity, misinterpretation, misunderstanding, unappreciativeness, non-recognition, uh, lack of recognition, lack of gratitude, lack of appreciation, inconsiderateness, thoughtlessness, rudeness, unmanner unmannerliness. <laughs> Did I get it right? No, no. <laughs> and graciousness. Now you might say, well, those aren't all, that's not all the opposite of thankfulness. Some of those things are the opposite of other things. You know what? But what I was, when, as I was looking at that list and I was thinking about it, I was thinking the, the less thankful I am, the more those things happen in my life. The more these other things, indifference, um, all these other things, because if I'm an ungrateful person, I become an indifferent person. I become selfish. These other things start to happen in my life. And so if I come back to that place of being, thank, of being thankful, these things start to work their way out of my life because I use every opportunity to give thanks. If I'm giving thanks, it's very hard to hate someone or something. If I'm giving thanks, it's very hard to be indifferent. If I'm giving thanks, it's very hard to be unmannerliness. Unmannerly. Thank you, Nora and uh, Janine. Thank you. When we don't choose thankfulness, what this list tells me is that the end state is not good. The end state is not good. So here's some fruit of unthankfulness. Just to take that and just boil it down a little bit. The first one would be, un be complaining. I've been asking this question through the week. I'd say to someone, I'd say, tell me, what's the opposite of thankfulness? And they say, unthankfulness. I'm like, that's not helpful. helpful. <laughs> that's unhelpful. I'm trying to think of, like, where, where does not saying thank you, where does it lead to? And one of the biggest 
places I think it leads to is a place of complaining. You see, if I don't say thank you, like when, you know, you've all, if, if you've got children, you've made food for your children. And you've all experienced your children being very grumpy about your food, right? Okay, I'm pretty sure it's happened to every parent at some point in your lives. You're like, my child's like, oh, why do, why do you cook this? Oh, do you have to eat this again? You know, that's complaining. And what you're trying to teach your child is say thank you. Just be grateful. And then you start telling them some story about some civil war somewhere where people don't have food. You all do it. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing. I was just, just thinking about complaining and I was reminded of the Israelites. And as they went into the, the wilderness, they complained over and over and over and over again. And God eventually got really upset with them. And eventually, they weren't not saved. Here's the thing about the, the Israelites. If you look at that, that story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, and you think of it as a, as a story of our salvation, coming out of Egypt was them getting saved. The blood of the lamb on the doorposts, it saved them from death. They came out of Egypt. Going through the Red Sea is like getting baptized. You know, like I got baptized, I come out of the Red Sea, and um, I'm now moving towards the promised land, the, the inheritance that God has got for me, the reward that he's got for me. But what's going to prevent you from the reward is unbelief. What's gonna, it's faith that pleases God. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Unbelief will prevent you from stepping into the reward. It will prevent you from stepping into the inheritance that he's got for you and for me. And those Israelites found themselves in a situation where because of unbelief, they could never step into the promised land and they ended up all dying in the wilderness. Now, were they saved? Yes, they were saved. If you think about it in a new covenant concept, they were absolutely saved, but they absolutely missed out on the inheritance. And one of the fruits of, the, of what, what happened as they went along the, the journey was some, they, would, they would be in a place, they, wouldn't have, they would not have something to eat and they'd complain. Then they wouldn't have have something to drink, and they would complain. And then they wouldn't have this, and they would complain. They kept saying it was better in Egypt. It was better in Egypt. And in some way, it sounds to me a little bit like sometimes what we do as Christians in our modern-day world where we complain about things. We complain about the price of petrol. We complain about this and complain about that. Now, as citizens of a nation, we, we have, there are certain rights that are our rights as citizens of, an, of, a, of a nation. But more important than that, we are citizens of another kingdom. We operate from a completely different mindset and way of thinking. We operate from heaven towards earth, not from earth towards wherever. But as citizens of this nation, there are times, we, we, there are elections that take place. There are things that we can do. We can get involved. We can do things. We can be responsible citizens of our nation. But our hope is never in that. Our hope is always in Jesus Christ. Amen? We can be responsible citizens, but, but that doesn't mean we can step into a place of complaining into a place of unthankfulness, a place of ungratitude, a place of I deserve better than this. We can be responsible in those situations to trust the Lord for heavenly solutions to earthly problems. But it's a completely different mindset to the one who's always complaining, always criticizing, always moaning, just like, oh, you know, I think I must just leave this country and go and live in Siberia. It's very cold there. So here we have these Israelites, and you know, the, the, the thing about complaining, it leads to unbelief. And the thing about unbelief is it prevents you from stepping into the fullness of what God called you to. It prevents you and I from stepping into the fullness of the inheritance that God gave us. In Hebrews 6, it talks about those who have tasted of the heavenly gift and received the Holy Spirit. But there comes a moment in, in your life due to unbelief where you are prevented from go, growing, from continuing on into maturity. That's a very, very serious, serious situation to find yourself in. But the writer to the Hebrews goes on to say, he says, but we have better things to say of you. You're not in that category. And you're like, phew, okay. So he's telling those Hebrew guys, like, this is what can happen if you step into unbelief. You're going to, God will, God will, God is the one who allows you and I to step on into maturity or not. It's his choice. And God can stop that if our unbelief is getting in the way of our, of our faith journey. But then he, the writer says to the Hebrews, he says, but, I, but there's, we, I, we believe better things of you guys. Like that's, that's not who you are. And so you can read that and go, okay, cool. That's not who I am. Um, and may it never be who I become. But you know what? It is who the Israelites who died in the desert became. They were unable to step into the promised land. 
They were unable to move on into maturity. They were unable to move on into the promise that God had given them because of their unbelief. Now, that's all incredibly serious and incredibly, it's a very big thing and it's very theological. But if you move it all the way back, it started with them complaining. And that sounds so simple. It's like they were just complaining. But complaining can lead to big problems, which is why we have to deal with it as soon as we see it operating in our lives. We can't allow it to continue even another five minutes. We've got to get rid of it. And complaining is a fruit of unthankfulness. Am I making sense? Another fruit of unthankfulness is criticism. Now, I'm going to say this to be funny, okay? To say, I'm not talking about anybody in this room. You know, it's definitely the Christians down the road, but not the Christians here. You know, there are those Christians. We all know those Christians out there. But I want to say, if the shoe fits, wear it and deal with it as well. Amen? Because I wouldn't be doing us any justice if I'm preaching these things and then we go like, well, it doesn't apply to any of us in this room. Well, then I shouldn't be preaching it. It's got to somehow, it's got to fit somewhere. It's going to fit somewhere and we've got to really think. And if it doesn't fit, then go, okay, cool. But I need to make sure I never step into that. There's got to be something of a, hmm, this is really hitting me somewhere deep inside. And I don't mind if you get cross with me. That's all right. Because my job is to help us all move into maturity. It's, that's the job that I, that I get to carry. And, we, and so if we're here and we're, and we're involved in this, we need, a, we need a, if God says something to us and we feel like, oh, let God do something so we can become more mature. Amen? Criticism. They are, they are, I, I'm blown away by how often cr- Christians criticize. Nothing is ever good enough. We think about even just in our church practical environment, you know, that color's wrong and then that thing's this and the next thing's that and that's that. And those are just simple things, you know, but it happened, that happens often, you know, little critical statements that are made about, I could have done that thing better. If I'd been the one doing that, I would have done it better. I would have uh, handled that situation better. That, that wasn't, wasn't handled correctly. Da, 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 da. But criticism also happens out in the world, in, the, in our space, in our workplace. We criticize our boss. We find people to tell about how terrible our boss is. Being critical of our boss, being critical of them, our employees, being critical of our colleagues, being critical of um, the way other people parent their children, being critical of the teachers that teach your children, being critical of the way um, the government is doing what the government does, being critical of the way somebody else is doing what they're doing, being critical of some person over on some other country somewhere doing what they do. They don't even know who you are and they don't really care what your opinion is. But we still get critical and we still have a lot to say. We even get critical about how they play rugby. Unless you're a Stormers fan. Then you've got a lot to be happy about. But we said that nothing is ever good enough. We point fingers. If we don't say it, sometimes we think it. We think these thoughts that go through our minds. It's, it's, it's a crit- critical mindset of, I could have done that much better. Sometimes we disguise criticism as a push for excellence. We're like, we say, no, but it's about being excellent. And, but in doing that, what we're actually doing is we, we're, we're actually criticizing the way something's already being done. All things can always be better. Amen? We've got to be very careful that in the process we don't become critical. The third thing I wanted to mention is self-absorption. Self-absorption. And it's going to sound very similar to the next one, which is selfishness, but it's slightly different. Self-absorption. Where it becomes all about you. Usually in a, in a negative sense. All about, you know, my job, my boss, my family, my situation. We find it very hard to engage in other people's stories because we're completely lost in our own story. And when we're lost in our own story, you see, a person who walks in thankfulness has, a, has an outward-looking pers- uh, uh, focus and mindset. A person who walks in thankfulness is e- is, finds it easy to engage in other people's stories and help other people and inspire other people. But a person who's ungrateful finds themselves absorbed and lost in their own story, self-absorption. And so everything is about, you know, your, my, you know, my job is bad. This is what's going on in my family. This is happening. This thing's happening. And, there's, there's, and we, can still, we can couch that in a very spiritual way. But even in the way we couch it, we still, it all still kind of revolves around me, self-absorption. Which leads to the next one, selfishness. This is the fruit of unthankfulness, selfishness. Selfishness really is, is it's about my comfort. If I don't feel like it, I won't do it. I, I want to be comfortable. If, I, if it's, you know, if the weather's not 
it's perfect. I'm not going to go to church. I'm going to, you know, just stay at home. I'm going to um, just, I'm going to just, my comfort levels are more important than anything else. Church must fit me and my lifestyle. I'm not going to change my lifestyle to fit church. I'll be involved in life and in community and in whatever it is that God wants me to be involved in if it suits me and if it fits my lifestyle. And that's selfishness. Let me move on quickly. Stubbornness. Stubbornness is a, is a fruit of, un, of, of unthankfulness. See, if we, are per, if we are people who are thankful, thankful is a posture of humility, which I think I'm going to mention later on. It's a posture of humility. So if we are a thankful people, we find it very easy to learn and to grow. But when we aren't thankful, when we're ungrateful, we, we create an unteachable wall between us and others. And so we can't learn. We can't grow. When, when someone says something to us, we twist the truth around. There's always an excuse. So if someone says, hey, I think there's something that, that needs to be adjusted in your life, we can find some excuse for why we're not going to adjust it. Lack of teachability. It's, about, it's being stubborn. I've got two more fruit before we get um, into the, in, uh, excited again, happy again, okay? And maybe we'll just preach on thankfulness again next week because maybe we've just got to sit on this for a little bit. We'll see. Um, but the, another fruit of unthankfulness is hypocrisy. Pretending to be who you aren't. Or pretending to believe something that you don't. Um, if we're thankful people, it, we become very sincere and very authentic. When we're an unthankful people, it's very easy to be hypocritical about certain things. We can just look right in certain environments. Say the right things to get the right outcomes. But it's not the truth of who we are on the inside. Engaging in spiritual behaviors to look good and receive praise rather than having the motivation of truly wanting to please the Lord. That's hypocrisy. And then lastly, disobedience. Plain old disobedience. Disobedience is one of the greatest of all ways to express unthankfulness. You know, those Israelites kept disobeying what God had said because they were just ungrateful and unthankful. They were out of Egypt. They were Christians, but they were disobeying, and so they were not able to continue into what God had called them to. And so just sometimes you just go, I'm just, I'm just not going to, I know that's what I meant to do, but I'm not going to do that because I don't have a thankful attitude and disposition on the inside of me. Okay, so that's the bad stuff. Are you all still feeling okay? The root of unthankfulness, really, it's rooted in the, in, in, in the, in the lack of the fear of God. The lack of the fear of God. If you had to boil it all the way down to one thing, it's the lack of the fear of God. Romans chapter 1. Some of you are wondering when we're going to open our Bibles. You can turn to Romans chapter 1, and then you can read this verse together with me, and then you can turn to Psalm 69. So you can put your finger in Psalm 69, but we're going to start in Romans 1. Romans 1 verse 21. Psalm 69. Everyone okay? Romans 1 verse 21 says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. That's a very, I find that phrase, just a strange phrase to throw in in that. Paul's really getting into some, he's going to get into some very deep theological content in the book of Romans. And he's talking about people, these, this, this group of people that God has just let them go futile in their own thoughts and so on. The rest of the verse says they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. But the thing he felt to point out in saying this is that although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. So they, they, they knew God, they knew he was there, but they didn't glorify him as God. He wasn't God in their lives. And, and then he says, nor were they thankful. You see, thankfulness is an acknowledgement of God in my life. And when I say thank you to Gerard, if Gerard comes out and let's say, let's just use a silly illustration like Gerard brings me a cup of coffee and I say thank you. That thank you, in a, it's a polite thing to do because we've been taught in our world that that's polite, right? But it's deeper than that. It's me saying thank you to the Lord through saying thank you to Gerard. You see, any thankfulness to the Lord outworks itself in thankfulness towards people. You can't say, just like, just like the, 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 the true test of whether you're, you're a mature, mature following the Lord or not, is your love for people, not your love for the Lord. The true test is your love for people, not, the, not your love for the Lord. Because anyone can say, I have great love for the Lord. Well, how, how do you prove it? Yeah, but I love the Lord. Me and him, we like tight. You prove your love for the Lord through your love for people. 
if you can't love Paul, David, not Paul, David, none of them. John says in his letter at the end, in, in 1 John, he says, he says, how can you say that you love God if you hate your brother? The relationship with the Lord always gets worked out humanward this way. It's a horizontal, the horizontal relationship has to demonstrate what's going on here. If there's just this, you're just a, you, it's just mystical. It's just weird and strange. If it's just this, it's humanistic. It's, it's the woke world and the woke culture. Could all love each other. Could all accept each other. Completely, they don't understand what love is. They have no cooking clue what love is. God defines what love is. But what it should look like is relationship with him that gets outworked in relationship with each other. So because I love him, I love you. And because I'm thankful to him, I'm thankful to you. You see, when I'm unable to be thankful to my, to my, the, my friends, my family, people around me, to, to us in this room, we're unable to express thankfulness. The issue actually is a God issue. I'm not thankful towards him. Making sense? So Romans 121 again says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. The end result is they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So the lack of the fear of God leads to you and I being wise in our own eyes, thinking that we, we become the God in our own universe. We become the center of our universe. And when that happens, thankfulness goes out the window because thankfulness acknowledges there's someone greater than you. Thankfulness acknowledges that you don't have it all and I don't have it all, that there's a gift that comes. It's, it's, it's understanding that something's come my way that I don't deserve. And I believe we've got to take it even beyond that to the point where we might even feel like we deserve what comes our way, but we still say, say thank you. When last, just not don't say yes or no, but when last when your boss um, paid your salary, your salary rather than your account, did you say thank you? Do you go up to, like, if you're a school teacher, do you go up to your principal and say, hey, thank you, I just want to thank you for my salary. You're like, no, I deserve this. I just worked really hard this month. But imagine if we actually started to become thankful for those things. We started to become thankful for, well, I'm thankful when I'm acknowledging saying thank you to the person who employs me. I'm actually saying thank you to God for the fact that I have a job. Because my human outward uh, 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 thankfulness is demonstrated, it, uh, the outflow of that comes from our relationship with him. Okay, I could have probably said that way better. But you got the point of what I was saying. Say thank you for, you know, when, when, when you, if you happen to be sitting in a, a coffee shop and you order a cup of coffee and the person brings a coffee, say thank you. If you, um, if at the toll gate, say thank you to the lady at the toll gate. If you're paying for your food in the, in the grocery store, say thank you to the lady who's serving you. It's an acknowledgement that God is my provider in my life. You might say, well, she's getting paid to do that and I'm spending my money to buy the, to, 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 to pay for this food. There's no thank you involved. No, there's so much thank you involved. There's thank you involved in every detail. You know, every little aspect of life, even the things that you and I think we deserve. Try that this week. Go to your boss and say, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, for the salary. Thank you so much for, um, for the job. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity that I have. Now, now, you might hate your job. Anyone hate your job? Don't put your hand up. I'm a little concerned because one of my staff members has put their hand up. So can we just pause? I just need to go and have a coffee. <laughs> yeah. You might hate your job, but you know what thankfulness does? It attracts the rain of heaven. It attracts the rain of heaven. If your attitude in your heart, my attitude in my heart change and we go up to the person, even if they're giving us a hard time, we say, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the job. Thank you for allowing me to whatever it may be. Thank you that I was, I've been able to do this. You know, when, when um, I'll, it's, I, I've, I've had a couple of car issues over the last little while, every now and then I have to just pause and say, thank you, Jesus, that I have a car. Because if I didn't have a car, I wouldn't have car issues. And some of you in this room, you want to have a car. You long to have car issues, you know. And, and I, I can be standing going, oh, no, 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 no. I have a car. And for those who long to have a car in this room, I bless you with a car in Jesus' name. God will give you the desire of your heart. And if you desire the Ferrari, well, I'm not going to prophesy over you. I'm not one of those kinds of guys. But what I will say is just work really hard. <laughs> 
maybe maybe one day you'll be able to take one for a drive. <laughs> uh, that was yeah. May God give you a car. May God give you what you need to do to fulfill this assignment that He's got for your life. Amen. And you know, some of the things we complain about are the fruit of the of the grace of God in our lives, and we've got to kill the complaining. Now we really, really just literally have to kill the complaining. Like it's it's actually got to be like 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 you might be in the house with somebody later on today and they start complaining about something, just in a very kind, tactful, gracious way, remind them of what was preached about this morning. Choose your moments wisely, especially if you're a guy. Choose your moments wisely. The ladies, you still love me, right? Just checking. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to just mention this quickly and then we'll end. Um, at the core and the heart of unthankfulness also is a sense of entitlement. And if you and I can kill the entitlement in our lives, um, I really believe that God is going to work in, do an incredible work in and through our lives if we can kill entitlement. We're living in, a, in the world that we live in, entitlement is such a big deal. It's my right, I deserve, I'm entitled to, this is, I, you know, and, and because it doesn't then go, and you may be entitled. I've, anyone stood in a very long queue all day and you like, you're entitled to the service that you're meant to be receiving at the end of that queue and you complain about the queue all the way to the end. Anyone be in that situation? You're absolutely, enti- and, and absolutely in a, in, in a well-organized environment, there shouldn't be that long a queue, 100%. So, so the, the, the reality of the situation is there, but our heart attitude is what's really important in that moment. And I, sometimes I wonder how, if God's like, well, I'm just going to let them keep getting stuck in cues until they get this. Maybe. <laughs> well, thank you for mentioning that because I, I forgot to mention that, actually. And that's actually what, what, what triggered my message this week was the load shedding situation. It just occurred to me, uh, we are five months in, and we've maybe had two days of no load shedding in five months. And so I started to think about that. And then you start to get a little bit irritated. And none of you get irritated about load shedding ever. Especially as you're about to boil the kettle and it goes off. Or you're about to put something in the mouth, whatever it might be. Or you're just a, you know, about to make a phone call or send, do something on, and the signal disappears. I really believe that this is an environment and a season where God wants to teach us supernatural thankfulness. Entitlement is a form of pride. I think about uh, Colossians 3 verse 22, Paul speaking to slaves, I'll just read it to you. He says, bond servants or slaves, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with our service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Now what blows me away is, I don't think Paul was condoning slavery, but he was telling slaves that if the gospel is alive inside of your heart, here's your attitude. Imagine that. These guys were property. They, they had absolutely no rights in their lives at all. They were property. And the gospel of Jesus Christ had come and it saved them. And Paul says, now that you're a child of God, here's your attitude. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Because you have a greater master than that master. And so this is that whole thing of I say thank you to you, but it's actually I'm saying thank you to him. Thank you for the job I don't like because I'm saying thank you to him that I have the opportunity to work. Amen? Obeying all things your master's according to the flesh, not with our service, not as men pleases, but in since actually, I'm sincere about it, sincerity of heart. I'm going to work even harder as a slave to please my master because I have Jesus in my life. That's what Paul was saying. That sounds very much like the opposite of entitlement to me. It's gone very quiet in this, in this um, conservative, charismatic church. And then he, he, in, the, in the last little two words there in that uh, scripture is fearing God. In sincerity of heart, fearing God. Obeying all things your masters according to the flesh, not with our service as men pleases, but in, not with our service, not as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. You see, the fear of God is where thankfulness begins. The lack of the fear of God is where thankfulness goes out the window. We need to acknowledge him. Thankfulness is an acknowledgement of God in my life. Okay, that's where we're going to leave it today. I'm not going to read Psalm 69. Because let's just let that sink in. Is that okay? We're going to do communion. And 
I want to remind us that thankfulness begins at the cross. Thankfulness begins at the place of. The reason why the slave could serve his or her earthly master was because there was an understanding that all of us were slaves to sin. But Jesus died on the cross and he set us, he redeemed us from the curse of slavery. He redeemed us from the law. He redeemed us from sin. Amen? Thankfulness begins at that moment. You see what the cross does is it levels the playing field for all of us. Regardless of where you and I are in our lives, regardless of our, our social place, our, whatever our bank account looks like, whatever the, the experiences of our lives are, regardless of all of that, across the planet, the cross levels it for everybody. Jesus died for sinners. God so loved the world that he gave his son, that we would not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'd like us today, if, if Kwas is here you, and CJ, you guys can come jump on the jump and, and just begin to play. And um, I'd like us today as we take communion this morning to really just ask God to deal with us on the inside when it comes to this thing of thankfulness. And begin to thank him. Just begin to think of things. Maybe you haven't thanked him for your job in a very long time. Thank him for your job. Thank him for, and for those who don't have, don't have jobs, thank him for the job he's going to give you. Thank him for what's going to come. Thank him that, there is, that there, is a, there is a better day ahead. Begin to prophesy. See, when, when, we, when we live from a place of thankfulness, it becomes much easier to hear God's voice for our future. We begin to hear him because we're no longer stubborn. We're no longer full of pride. We're walking in a place of humility. And we say, God, I, all that I have comes from you. Everything that I have. And that which I don't have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be grateful anyway. One of the greatest ways to demonstrate thankfulness is to celebrate somebody else's breakthrough. Celebrate somebody else having or getting or receiving that which you and I wanted to get. One of the greatest, greatest ways to, to step into a place of thankfulness. And I promise you this, what that does, is it attracts heaven. It attracts heaven in your life and my life. You see somebody else get married and you long to get married. Celebrate them. Cheer them on. Don't, don't be upset about, oh God, how did you overlook me? Celebrate them. Acknowledge what God has done. Be thankful on their behalf to the Lord. Maybe you're struggling in. We've talked about finances and debt and all of that. And you see somebody else have their debts. You declare the debts being paid off. And then somebody else's debts get paid off. And they stand up here and they give a testimony of just how God came through for them in some area of their lives and their debt was paid off in this area, whatever it might look like. And you're sitting there saying, well, what about me, God? You've overlooked me. No, the attitude of thankfulness looks like, God, I thank you for the breakthrough in that person's life. You see, because we're family. When one part suffers, we all suffer. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. That's what it looks like to have a thankful attitude. I acknowledge God. I acknowledge God. And maybe we need to begin to think about situations in our lives where we have carried a little bit of criticism, negativity. We've been maybe a little bit upset about somebody else's breakthrough. And just begin to, even now as we take communion, say, God, I thank you for that person. I thank you for that person's breakthrough. Thank you, Lord God, that you have, for the way you've blessed them. And remember, it's about sincerity of heart. When Paul spoke to the slaves, he said, with sincerity of heart. Don't just say it, because David said so, because it might be a nice formula. It's not about a formula. It's about an honest, genuine sincerity on the inside of us. Amen. So, Father God, I thank you for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for making a way for us. Thank you, Lord, for making a way for us to come back to life. A way to deal with our sin and our shame and the darkness that we found ourselves in. Thank you, Jesus, for saying yes.